Hello, uh, thank you for tuning in today. My name is Marianne Lau, and I am a PhD student at McGill University in Counseling Psychology. And I am also a therapy intern at the Emotional Health CBT Clinic. So as part of the Dr. Michael Spivak Memorial Lecture Series, today I'm going to be talking to you about um, obsessions and compulsions and how to manage them. So just to give you a little bit of an agenda for what I'm going to be talking about today, first, I'm just going to be introducing very briefly um, what anxiety is, and then moving on to define obsessions and compulsions, as well as uh, looking into obsessive compulsive disorder. And then I'm going to give you an overview of what the treatment for these issues might look like, as well as a few strategies that can help with managing these symptoms. And finally, I'm just going to wrap it up with um, a little conclusion. So very broadly, what is anxiety? So anxiety is a feeling of fear or dread that I'm sure most of us um, are familiar with. And uh, it includes multiple things. So it includes uh, thoughts like worries or fears of the future. It can also include behaviors like avoidance of certain things or situations um, or safety behaviors. And uh, it also includes physical sensations, so things like a rapid heartbeat, uh, um, shortness of breath, or um, you know, feeling like you have sweaty palms. And uh, like most emotions, anxiety is normal. It is uh, actually an adaptive response to stress. And feeling anxiety, despite the fact that it might be very distressing, is not dangerous or permanent. Um, so, you know, if you're in a situation that looks suspicious, looks dangerous, looks concerning, the feeling of anxiety that tells you to get out of there might actually be really helpful. The problem is when um, there is a false perception of danger. So you see things as potentially dangerous or harmful when they're not, um, or when anxiety interferes with um, your daily life and your enjoyment of it. So because some level of anxiety is um, adaptive and useful. Our goal is to manage anxiety, not eliminate it completely. And um, if we're looking more specifically at obsessions and compulsions, obsessions are repetitive and unwanted thoughts, images, or impulses that cause distress. And um, these are usually intrusions that pop into our head. They're not simply excessive worries about real life problems. There's something beyond that. And so to give you an idea of some of the common fears that we might see, um, people might fear getting a disease or um, being contaminated in some way, you know, having feeling like you've touched a dangerous substance or like you've touched germs or there might be germs on a surface. Um, you might also have thoughts about hurting somebody or harm coming to somebody you care about. And uh, you might also have um, intrusive thoughts about forgetting to do something. So you might you know, constantly think like, did I forget to turn off the stove before I left the house? Um, or did I forget to lock the door? And uh, obsessions can also be about doing something embarrassing or immoral, or it might be forbidden or taboo thoughts. And often these um, obsessions or intrusive thoughts are in direct contradiction to one's own value system. So it can be really distressing to experience them. And uh, attempts are made to ignore, suppress, or neutralize these thoughts. And, um, you know, to give you an idea about, uh, by some estimates, about 19% of individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder report having obsessions only without necessarily having um, compulsions. But if we look at compulsions, they are repetitive behaviors or mental acts or rituals um, done to bring down the anxiety in response to an obsession or that must be performed according to very rigid rules. So um, generally compulsions are aimed at preventing or reducing distress or to prevent a feared event or situation. So um, common behaviors might be, for example, checking. So before I said, you know, maybe you have repetitive thoughts about like, did I forget to turn off the stove? So you might go and check if the stove is on or off and you might go back and check it multiple times. Um, something else might be washing. So feeling like, you know, if you don't wash your hands for 10 minutes, you're gonna get sick or um, something else. Um, might also be, you know, cleaning or disinfecting surfaces. 
Uh, it can be counting. Um, it can be repeating reassurance or doing kind of like a mental ritual or a mental check to yourself. It might be repeating prayers. It could be arranging or rearranging something. And usually there is some recognition that what you're doing is excessive or unreasonable or, you know, um, a disconnected way to deal with that fear or that thought or that distress that you're having. And despite the fact that compulsions initially might give you a little bit of relief, which is why you why people do them, um, overall it is distressing. Engaging this behavior in these behaviors is distressing. And um, these compulsions can become time consuming and interfere with daily life. So in addition to obsessions and compulsions, we often see um, emotional and physical symptoms that accompany them. So emotional symptoms might be things like anxiety, fear, um, guilt, shame, or disgust. And these can, also, um, these can be about you know, the content of the obsessions or about um, the compulsions. It can be about something external. They can be directed at the self. And uh, you might also see some physical symptoms that are um, often linked to anxiety. So things like palpitations, you know, rapid heartbeat, difficulty breathing, chest pain, nausea or dizziness or feeling faint or things like that. So it is important to note that most people get intrusive thoughts. Um, we can't actually control many of the thoughts that come into our heads. And the difference is really in the evaluation and response to these intrusive thoughts. And problems can arise from overestimating the likelihood of a feared negative event happening um, or overestimating the damage that would result from this event, as well as overestimating the personal responsibility and consequences of being held responsible for this. We're going to go into these things in a little bit more detail later. But before that, um, I'm just going to give you some facts about obsessive compulsive disorder. So um, it is, you know, characterized by the presence of obsessions or compulsions or both. Actually, most individuals diagnosed with um, OCD report both the presence of obsessions and compulsions. And these symptoms are time consuming. You know, you're seeing like over an hour per day um, spent engaging in compulsions, for example, and cause really high levels of distress. And you can see a reduced quality of life overall, as well as high levels of social and occupational impairment because of this. Usually the onset of symptoms is during adolescence or early adulthood, but studies have shown that in some people, some symptoms um, can actually be detected in childhood. And uh, OCD affects um, it about one to 3% of the population. So if you or somebody you know is struggling with these symptoms, you know, you are definitely not alone. And um, in terms of the process by which um, OCD might be maintained, basically you have, you know, distressive thoughts, distress of obsession, distressing obsessions, and then you try to selectively avoid or neutralize that thought in some way. You know, you neutralize it with a ritual or you try to avoid these specific thoughts. Um, you know, you try to find distractions from them and you might also try to avoid situations associated with the thoughts. So if you have thoughts of, um, you know, you're scared that you're dangerous to other people, you might start avoiding situations when there's a lot of people. And these situations might work temporarily. So they might give you a little bit of relief in the moment, but over time they become part of the problem. So if you're avoiding or neutralizing, you never have the chance to find out if your fears are correct, if your fears of the thought or the situation are actually accurate, because um, they might not be. And by avoiding and neutralizing, you're kind of reinforcing the idea that you should be afraid of these thoughts or of these objects. And the, you know, the good news is that um, this cycle can be broken by experiencing the thoughts without attempting to avoid or neutralize them. And what this does is have, if you repeatedly experience these thoughts without avoiding or neutralizing, um, you weaken the association between the thoughts and the distress, the anxiety, the fear, all of these negative emotions. Um, and you know, you're going to be weakening this association over time and eventually break it. We tend not to do this um, on our own, kind of naturally, for a few valid reasons, which is that we fear that the, this 
distress is going to continue if we don't avoid or neutralize. Um, we fear that the distress will be unbearable if we don't avoid or neutralize. Um, or we might also fear that the thoughts will cause some unacceptable action or consequence. So, you know, you might feel like if you don't neutralize one of these intrusive thoughts, um, you might hurt somebody or harm might come to a loved one. So then, you know, you're really afraid of not engaging in avoiding and neutralizing. But, um, you know, the, the hopeful bit of news um, is that these uh, issues have been shown to be treatable and many people can break the association between the thoughts and the distress. So I'm just giving, I just wanna give you a little bit of a, of a glimpse into what that might look like. So if we're looking at it from a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective, the two main focuses or principles for treating um, OCD is first to eliminate unhelpful coping strategies like avoidance or neutralizing, you know, rituals, compulsions, um, and also to think about obsessions, you know, these intrusive thoughts in a more balanced and maybe helpful way. Basically, um, one, you know, baseline thing that you would probably do at the beginning is just to start monitoring your symptoms. So the time spent um, in compulsions or obsessions, you know, the amount of times that you do you know, like the checking, for example, how long is it going to take the intensity of anxiety and the content of the obsessions and compulsions, you know, just really kind of create a log, like a scientist, so that over time, can you can see if the strategies you're using are helping, um, which ones help more than others, if you're improving over time. And there are quite a few strategies that can be used to manage um, obsessions and compulsions. And these include uh, changing the routines, so like kind of disrupting your rituals, creating um, a fear hierarchy and exposing yourself to it, to your fears, uh, challenging the meaning given to obsessions, targeting avoidance of the thoughts, separating thoughts from actions, and challenging overestimations of danger or responsibility. So I know that I was a lot of information, so I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail um, about these strategies. So basically, like I mentioned earlier, one strategy is to change the routine of your compulsions. So almost anything you do to interrupt um, or change, you know, disrupt rituals is going to be progress. So for example, um, you, if you know, if you're at the moment that you feel like you can't just not do the ritual, you have to do it. Um, you might perform it very slowly. Um, or you might repeat it an unusual number of times. So let's say you usually uh, check the lock on the door three times. You might do it two and see how it is. Um, or maybe four, you know, something that just kind of disrupts the way uh, it habitually goes. And Or you might postpone it. You know, you say, like, I feel like I need to engage in this neutralizing ritual, but I'm going to do it an hour from now, um, 10 minutes from now. Or, you know, when I get back home, just try to postpone it. So anything that disrupts um, the compulsions. And then, so the next thing, this is really, I think, like a cornerstone of a lot of um, OCD treatment. It's going to be exposure. So the first thing you would do is create an exposure hierarchy. So if you've been tracking your obsessions and compulsions, like I mentioned before, um, you know, you kind of have a good idea of, of what you're dealing with in terms of behaviors and thoughts. And you can create a fear ladder. So, sorry, just getting some water. So you're, you're gonna wanna build your fear ladder. And what you do is basically you rank um, your obsessions, avoided situations, um, feared thoughts or objects, and you're ranking them from kind of least anxiety inducing to most anxiety inducing, and you're ordering them in the ladder. So for example, if somebody has a really big fear of cats, you know, they have thoughts of, of cats and they're, it just really scares them. The bottom of the ladder might be to talk about a cat um, with a coworker or with somebody. And the peak might be like physically seeing a cat or petting them. So that's just kind of an idea of what the exposure hierarchy might look like. So if you're, you know, if you have really like, if you have fears of contamination um, the bottom rung might just be thinking about contamination and touching germs. At the top of the rung might be 
touching a surface that you think is really dirty and not washing your hands after you know there's like for every fear you can kind of create a ladder um a hierarchy from least scary to more scary and it really depends on the person and what your fears look like and once you've uh, you've built a hierarchy um you can begin exposure so exposure is um you know the more long long name is going to be exposure with response prevention is really the key for OCD so what exposure and response prevent response prevention does is that it weakens the link between the thoughts and the distress so generally what it is is exposure to feared objects or thoughts repeatedly until anxiety decreases um, while not neutralizing the anxiety with compulsions so i'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this but basically um, exposure and response to prevention is usually gradual so you're going to start with the lowest lowest item on your fear ladder um, and wait until um, you know and repeat it and wait until anxiety is reduced so once you've mastered this item, you're gonna want to move on to the next item. Um, mastering this item doesn't mean that anxiety has gone to zero necessarily. It could just be that anxiety has decreased by half. So the next step, um, you know, the next component of exposure is that it is consistent. So this is not gonna work if you're doing it just once in a while. The idea is really to do it repeatedly um, and it ideally can be practiced daily. So, this is something, um, this is really key and you want to be tracking your progress. So track how many times you're doing it, when you're doing it, what stage you're at, um, how much anxiety you're feeling, you know, you might rate it, rate your fear from one to 10. And then um, the interesting part, at least for me, um, is the methods. So in terms of how you do exposure, there's really a lot of room for creativity and kind of, you know, catering it to individually what your fears and what you what it looks like for you so um exposure it can be imagined or it can be in the real world so if you know if you're having um like a real world exposure might be why i said that be what i said before if you're if you have a really big fear of cats it might be actually petting a cat um or you know, if you have a really intrusive thoughts or fears about um, getting sick and throwing up, for example, it's something that, you know, you might be exposed to like toilet um, with sick in it in real life, or um, you might write scenarios about it happening. You might, um, you know, write a scenario and just read it over and over or say it to yourself. There's also some types of exposures that might be... Um, more difficult to do so things like if you have fears associated with planes it might not be very economical or effective to go on a plane every single day so you might do something like um listening to a recording of cabin sounds or watch a video of being inside a plane cabin while doing like um you know we're doing visualizations exercises um you know something like in real life again is uh you might touch a dirty surface but um, sometimes the exposure might be a fear to thought. So you might have a thought that, for example, like I am dangerous and just repeating that thought to yourself over and over without neutralizing is eventually going to decrease the amount of anxiety associated with the thought. So there's really, I feel like I can just keep coming up with examples because there's really a lot of room for creativity um, in terms of what your exposure look, looks like and what the different steps might be and what tools you can use. So the next kind of key component is response prevention. So for example, if um, we're doing, let's go with the example of contamination. If you're touching dirty surfaces or something, a surface that you fear might have germs on it, for example, um, you usually might be somebody who thinks that you need to wash your hands for 10 minutes after. But if we want to prevent the response, maybe you don't feel ready to completely prevent it. You might not be ready to not wash your hands at all. So you might decrease to washing your hands eight minutes instead of 10, and then five minutes instead of 10, and then ultimately touching a surface that you think is dirty and not washing your hands at all might be the, the ultimate goal. Um, and this can also include mental rituals. Sometimes rituals might be like trying to go through a list, reassuring yourself mentally. Rituals might be things that we can't see. So you are gonna try to avoid engaging in those. 
Um, and something that I want to like make clear with this is that anxiety in this process is normal. If you weren't feeling any anxiety at all, then you're probably not on the right track. And regardless of the intensity of anxiety, the way anxiety works is that eventually will peak and level off without engaging in compulsions, avoidance, or neutralizing. Um, and kind of what we do when we engage in avoidance or neutralizing is that we don't let ourselves learn that anxiety eventually goes down on its own. So um, do not be discouraged. This is hard work um, that often requires help, you know, maybe a therapist to kind of work the process through with you. But anxiety is normal, but this process does seem to work for a lot of people. So in terms of, um, you know, a little bit more detail, like I've said a few times uh, so far, I really want to drive the point home that avoiding or neutralizing the thoughts over time is going to worsen the anxiety. And also, it just um, doesn't really seem to work. Selectively trying to avoid certain thoughts doesn't really seem to work. And you're just teaching yourself that you should be afraid of these thoughts. So when I say it doesn't really seem to work, um, if I try to tell you right now not to think of a polar bear, you're actually going to find it really hard to not think of a polar bear like my friend right here. Um, so an experiment you might want to try is um, if you're somebody who tends to avoid or neutralize thoughts, um, do that on one day. And then the next day, allow yourself to sit and experience the thoughts and compare your outcomes. You know, put on your scientist hat, bring in a little curiosity and compare how you felt or, um, you know, like a, what happened. What was the difference between both days? In terms of um, if we're going a little bit more on like the cognitive side, uh, we want to challenge the meaning given to obsession. So like I mentioned before, everybody has unpleasant thoughts and intrusive thoughts are really quite common, but people might give different meaning to these intrusive thoughts. So let's say you're walking through the street, through the streets, <laughs> you're walking down the street and you have an intrusive thought about hurting somebody that you don't actually want to do. It's just you know, an unpleasant thought that pops into your head. Um, somebody might see that thought and say, oh, wow, that's a weird thought, and then kind of go along their day. But somebody else might see that thought and be like, oh, my God, this is important. This is really scary. This is a dangerous thought. It means that I'm a bad person. Do I want to hurt people? Am I a bad person for this? And it kind of sets off this fear, um, an emotional cycle, so that you can really see that the, the meaning we give to intrusive thoughts can really change how we engage with them. Something else that we want to challenge um, is for a lot of people who um, struggle with OCD symptoms, there might be an overestimation of responsibility. So you might be feeling overly responsible for having these thoughts in the first place, for engaging in compulsions to neutralize these thoughts, or feeling like you're really responsible for preventing some catastrophic outcome. Um, so if you're somebody who tends to do this or to be really harsh on yourself or to you know, responsibilize yourself for many things, there is, these are two strategies that might be helpful with that. So the first one is the pie chart technique. Um, pie chart, basically what you would do is you would draw a beautiful little pie chart like I have here, and then you start filling in the amount of uh, responsibility that might be held by other parties or factors other than yourself, and you leave your part for last. So, you know, you you might be, you might be thinking something like, um, if I don't neutralize this thought or if I don't engage in this thought, um, I might, you know, somebody's going to have a car accident. But then when you start doing this pie, you might see that that person might hold a bit of the responsibility. The weather might hold a bit of the responsibility. Other drivers on the road might hold a little bit of the responsibility. And then when you get to the end, to your part of the pie, you might realize that the responsibility where you are giving yourself is really not, it's, it's a lot smaller or maybe none compared to the responsibility that other parties or factors might have. Um, and another thing that you might do is the double standard technique. So basically, whenever you're holding yourself really responsible for something or, hold, or being really harsh towards yourself, you might want to ask if you would say such things to a friend or a loved one in a similar situation. Um, Unfortunately, it's often easier to be 
to, to show more empathy to others than to ourselves. So think, would you, would you say these things or would you give the same level of responsibility to somebody else? Um, and if not, why not? Then what might you say instead? And then try to channel this towards yourself. Um, also, another piece is challenging overestimations of danger. So if you have like a really, um, you know, like a feared situation, event or outcome, you might try to seek out some data or kind of, you know, again, put on your scientist hat and look at some data or evidence about the actual probability of these things happening or not happening. And um, some things that you, you know, some questions that you might want to ask yourself is, what is the evidence for and against this being true or this actually happening? Um, have I confused my thoughts with facts? That's a really, really key one when you're, when you're dealing with OCD usually. And um, are my interpretations of the situation realistic? Are there other points of views that I might consider? Or am I using polarized thinking? So polarized thinking is really when you have, when you're seeing something as either a zero or a hundred percent black and white or extremely terrible or extremely good. Um, you know, am I using polarized thinking or is there a bit of room for nuance or for gray areas? Um, or am I 100% sure this will actually happen? You know, these are just some questions you can ask yourself. And, um, you know, lastly, I really, really want to emphasize thoughts are not actions. Um, thinking something will not make it more likely to happen. If not, um, you know, you could, you can, I can think I will win the lottery as much as I can, uh, as much as I want. And I probably, unfortunately, will not be winning the lottery. So thinking something will not make it more likely to happen, whether it's something good or bad. Um, and thinking bad thoughts does not make you a bad person or mean that you want to do something bad. A lot of people have unpleasant thoughts. A lot of people have intrusive thoughts that go against their values. And this does not mean that you're a bad person. Um, and you can also do a little behavioral experiment like I did with my, with my lottery example. It's test whether the obsession or the intrusive thoughts you know, just observe whether it actually leads to a catastrophe or an unacceptable action, because most of the time it won't. Um, so, you know, again, try to put on your scientist hat and observe the outcome of these things. So I just want to leave you with um, some concluding thoughts. So, you know, some um, anxiety is normal and helpful, but then some people might experience high level of anxiety and a cycle of distressing obsessions and compulsive um, behaviors in response. But the good news is that this cycle can be broken by experiencing thoughts without attempting to avoid or neutralize them. And every time you do this, you're weakening the link between intrusions, you know, intrusive obsessions and distress. And like we saw today, there can be several strategies that can help manage and target these symptoms. Um, a good resource if you want to read a little bit more about what we talked, at, talked about today um, is Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder by Jonathan Grayson. Um, and also, you know, a little bit of, of advice is practicing relaxation techniques in general. You know, it can be meditating, it can be exercising, it can be filling your life with positive things, um, time management, anything that can help lower your stress overall might also help with these symptoms. And just the, you know, pieces of information that I really, really want to leave you with is that if you're somebody who is struggling or has struggled or knows somebody who's struggling with, um, with some of the symptoms I've talked about today, you're definitely not alone. Um, unpleasant and intrusive thoughts are common. And unfortunately, many people struggle with obsessions and compulsions. But the good news is that these issues are treatable. So there are many strategies um, and, you know, kind of treatment approaches that can help you target unhelpful coping behaviors and challenging the meaning that you're giving to thoughts. And, um, you know, if it's something that you're interested in, I definitely recommend people seek help because a qualified therapist can definitely help, um, help you manage and treat these issues and kind of engage in some of the strategies that we've talked about today with a bit more support. So thank you so much for um, listening to me today and for, you know, taking the time to engage with us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.